Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. I'm Andrea, and I will be your host for today's session on Moonbounce. Um, just before we jump into the webinar, let me share what we have been up to. So recently we have opened our call for papers for the Hardware IO USA edition, for which we are looking for advanced technical research covering diverse topics, including, but not limited to, hardware pen testing, embedded systems, cryptography, automotive and medical device security, smartphone firmware, or telecom networks. Nevertheless, if you have any kind of hardware security research, feel free to share it and we will get back to you. The deadline for this is the 1st of March, so you still have one month to go. At the same time, we have also opened our registration for our hands-on trainings um, on a variety of topics, for instance, uh, hardware hacking basics, um, car hacking, uh, side channel analysis, reverse en en engineering firmware with Ghidra, or reverse engineering uh, baseband firmware. Um, our early bird is still available. So if you're interested in any of these topics, please feel free to head to our training section. Today, uh, I am happy to welcome Mark. Mark is a senior security researcher at Kaspersky. And in today's presentation, he will explain how in the spring of 2021, his team was made aware of novel threat against using UEFI in the wild, where it was evident that attackers had modified and embedded an implant with a benign UEFI firmware image. Mark and his team dubbed this discovered implant Moonbounce, and in this talk, we will learn more uh, delicate details about how Moonbounce research went from its inception up until uh, today. Uh, Mark, I would like to invite you to start your presentation. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Andrea. I hope uh, everybody can see my screen, right? Yes, we do. Good. Uh, okay, so uh, hello everyone, and uh, thank you for joining this webinar uh, hosted by Hardware IO. Uh, as Andrea mentioned, my name is Mark Lechtig, and today I'm going to walk you through uh, a recent research uh, released by Kaspersky on a UEFI uh, firmware implant uh, that we dubbed Moonbounce. Uh, before we dive in, uh, a quick uh, introduction to the people who were involved in this research. Um, and those are um, Vasily Bernikov and Ilya Borisov uh, from our anti-malware research team, uh, as well as De Denis Legezo um, and myself, um, who are part of GREAT, which is the global research and analysis team of Kaspersky. Now, uh, if you join me here today, uh, you probably uh, have a general idea of what we are going to talk about, or at least you should uh, from the title. Uh, but uh, still so, what is it uh, that we are going to discuss? So uh, the story that uh, underlies uh, the, this webinar revolves around the discovery um, that my colleagues and myself had at the end of last year, uh, wherein uh, Kaspersky's firmware scanning technology uh, has made us aware that a formerly unknown uh, UFI uh, firmware implant was actually lurking in the wild. And interestingly, from our analysis, um, we could learn that uh, this particular uh, threat was, in a sense, more advanced than uh, other UFI firmware implants that we have seen so far, which, um, to be honest, are quite a rare occurrence um, in and of themselves. And as a matter of fact, we are uh, considerably confident that the actor who uh, deployed this particular implant is uh, an infamous threat group that goes by the name of APT41. And in this webinar, I'd like to share with you how we reached that conclusion. Uh, but more notably, I would like to go into the technical specifics um, of this um, curious piece of malware that we found. Of course, uh, everything that we are going to talk about here uh, was already documented in Kaspersky's blog on securelist.com. You can access it uh, through the QR code that you see on the screen and get up to date with all the research details that concern this case. So uh, to contextualize this implant's behavior on the system, I will first quickly review how exactly UFI works. And you probably know uh, by now that UFI is the standard that constitutes how the boot process on most of the modern PCs and laptops uh, work, uh, works. And it can be broken down essentially into several stages. Uh, 
Uh, the first two stages um, that you see on the screen right now that are referred to as the security and the pre efi initialization environment um, are executed from a designated hardware on the motherboard called the SPI flash chip. Uh, and those are essentially in charge of initializing the most uh, imperative components of the machine, like the CPU and chipset. But most notably, they initialize uh, the memory controller, which is um, fundamental, obviously, for creating a permanent address space um, in the computer's RAM in which any subsequent um, boot code can operate. From those two phases, um, control is then passed to an uh, important component of the boot chain, which is called the Dixie dispatcher. And that component also happens to be at the center of the infection chain that underlies the Moonbounce implant, and we will discuss this um, in a little bit. Now, what the Dixie dispatcher is in charge of is setting up what's called the driver execution environment. Uh, which um, is this sort of a restricted uh, environment that facilitates some basic control of uh, the machine prior to the loading of the operating system. So for example, uh, to allow boot code to access the disk uh, and load files from it, or allow later components in the boot sequence to uh, uh, print a console or a UI on the screen. Um, this environment uses a set of drivers that are called uh, Dixie drivers that allow uh, this sort of rudimentary uh, interaction with the machine's uh, hardware resources. Um, the access uh, to some of these resources is given through two sets of uh, basic APIs uh, referred to as the boot services and runtime services with uh, the boot services uh, being essentially uh, functions callable by other components uh, throughout the boot sequence um, being of the primary inter interest to us in the context of uh, the moon bounce infection. And again, I'll tackle uh, that um, in a short while. The next uh, part of the boot sequence is quite straightforward. That is uh, what we refer to as the boot dispatcher, which is uh, generally speaking a mechanism that allows the user to choose which operating system um, uh, to boot to in case uh, the user has more than one operating system uh, installed on the machine. And that would in turn invoke um, the particular um, and relevant operating system loader. Uh, and then the operating system loader will, of course, load the uh, corresponding operating system kernel, uh, which is where, roughly speaking, the boot sequence ends and the operating system takes control. So now with this very high level understanding and general framework of how UEFI works, um, we should probably ask ourselves, how uh, is Moonbounce's infection manifested uh, in it? And to answer it, we can break down uh, moon bounces infection to um, or moon bounce infection chain to four essential phases. Um, with the uh, core of the infection being based in the component that I described a few moments ago called the Dixie dispatcher. So in essence, what the attackers did uh, was to infect or modify uh, the image of this uh, particular component within the UEFI firmware on the SPI flash. Uh, and that allowed uh, further malicious code to propagate from, the, from this component to other boot sequence um, components uh, once the computer is started. More specifically, uh, the implant's code first reaches the uh, Windows operating system loader. Um, then it reaches the uh, Windows kernel. And finally, it deploys a malicious, components, uh, a malicious component in a Windows user mode process. So having that in mind, we can now articulate the particular steps that are taken from the moment uh, that the malicious Dixie dispatcher kicks in during the machine startup and until the malware propagates to user land process once uh, the operating system is up and running. So let's do it. So as I mentioned uh, a moment ago, um, the uh, core of the infection lies um, in some changes made by the attackers to uh, the uh, Dixie uh, dispatcher uh, in the firmware. And those changes are mainly the addition of um, inline hooks, first of all, of, of particular payload, and then inline hooks within um, 
some uh, EFI boot services functions that uh, divert the execution um, of the original execution of this component to the particular payload that is embedded within it. Generally speaking, uh, these hooks um, are plain patches to the first bytes um, of uh, the hooked functions, such that the first calls uh, to these functions are diverted to uh, designated hook handlers. Uh, after the first execution of each uh, such handler, the patched bytes um, are restored to the original ones and control is passed back to the original functions so as to um, not interfere with the regular boot sequence because essentially that one is still required to uh, work as well in order for the infection to properly go through. So let's try to tackle what each hook function uh, achieves in this stage. When the Dixie dispatcher runs uh, upon uh, the computer startup, it first uh, calls at a particular point uh, the allocate pool um, uh, boot service function. The hook logic, logic for this function will in turn uh, allocate a designated buffer in physical memory um, and will copy shellcode into it. Um, and we'll discuss this shellcode a little bit later. Um, before we do that, let's talk let's tackle another uh, function, which is the create event X uh, function, um, in which case uh, the hook function will be invoked, um, will eventually register a particular callback function for an event of a legacy boot. So as some of you know, um, UFI uh, has what's called CSM, um, uh, which stands for uh, compatibility, let me uh, recall the acronym, that should be uh, compatibility support module. And the compatibility, the compatibility support module uh, allows uh, essentially to load, um, to, to, to conduct a boot sequence that uh, initiates from the NBR uh, while uh, having alongside the UFI um, um, the, 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 the UFI loaded uh, through firmware as well. So um, that uh, kind of support for legacy boot uh, is facilitated by the CSM. And in the event of a legacy boot, uh, we'll have a callback that will allow uh, to map the uh, formerly um, uh, allocated buffer to which we wrote shellcode to map it to the address space of the Windows kernel uh, and invoke the shellcode uh, from within it. So we're kind of, um, uh, in this case, being able to tackle both cases, the legacy boot and the boot uh, through uh, UEFI firmware. Um, and then uh, after we have those two uh, hooks running and um, we actually let the uh, boot sequence carry on until um, we reach uh, the point of um, execution where the Windows loader runs. Um, so at, at this particular point, um, when the operating system's loader kicks in, uh, it is under essential to understand that uh, the cleanup and termination of the boot services um, is done by the OS loader. Um, and that is done through invocation of a function that is called exit boot services, which is in itself a part of the EFI boot service table. Um, so the hooking of this function is really what allows the malicious code to propagate uh, essentially from the Dixie dispatcher to the operating systems loader, which is uh, where it is in charge of installing um, another hook to a function that is called OSL arc transfer to kernel. Uh, this function is originally used to pass control from the loader, uh, from the OS loader to the Windows kernel. So invoking malicious code in that um, transition, transitional phase uh, when the OS kernel image is loaded in memory, uh, but has still not been executed uh, is what essentially allows uh, introducing further um, malicious modifications to the kernel itself. Um, an interesting uh, note here is that uh, this particular technique was actually um, been seen uh, in the Vault 7 leak uh, that consists of information on some of the uh, sensitive offensive tool set that is used by the CIA. And um, this could be used just you know, as a very broad speculation um, that um, the uh, threat actor 
could uh, could have used this particular uh, resource in order to mimic this particular technique. But again, this is just a speculation. So for the next step, uh, the OSL arc transfer to kernel hook um, installs yet another hook um, to a fundamental kernel API function called x allocate pool. Now recall that uh, during the Dixie dispatcher's execution, um, the malicious code set up a buffer with a shellcode and memory. However, that memory was not part of the Windows kernel virtual other space um, as the kernel was not running at that point, which is why um, the X allocate uh, pool hook first maps this particular buffer to the kernel's memory. Following that, um, um, it gets it passes control to the particular shellcode that is within this buffer, and in turn, the shellcode is in charge of reflectively loading um, an image that is embedded within um, uh, within um, the uh, original um, um, Dixie dispatcher. Um, sorry, within the original uh, driver um, and the uh, sorry uh, within the dispatcher and this driver. Um, is in turn um, in charge of notifying uh, what's called an image notify routine, uh, which is a callback that gets invoked upon a load of an image um, in the operating system. Um, and so now the question is, what is the purpose of that uh, callback that was set by the driver? Well, this particular callback uh, is intended to check uh, the path of the uh, primary image um, in each uh, process of the operating system and verify if the, 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 the image is loaded in the context of an SVC host that exe process with um, an argument um, that uh, is named net SVCS. Uh, or in other words, basically, uh, it tries to see if um, there is a loaded service in the operating system that has access to the network. Now, the first instance of such a service um, will actually uh, be used to inject uh, further uh, malicious code through the APC injection technique, um, which uh, would in turn um, allow to, which would in turn uh, reach out to a command and control server and we'll try to fetch a second stage payload from it. Unfortunately, uh, we were not able to uh, grab that particular payload, but um, nevertheless, we could still determine that the attackers um, who most likely deployed moon bounce on the infected uh, um, machine were, uh, were very likely affiliated to the APT41 group. Um, now, what is the APT41 group? So, APT41 is an infamous Chinese speaking threat group that uh, is known to be engaged in multiple high profile um, uh, espionage as well as criminal uh, operations, uh, including some uh, quite um, famous supply chain attacks. Um, um, for example, the, the one on CCleaner uh, that happened in 2017. And really why do we make the connection to this group? So, the primary reason is the fact that uh, throughout our investigation on other nodes uh, in the same network range, we were able to determine that uh, the attackers used a very specific uh, user land uh, implant called Scramble Pros um, that is actually known to be quite uh, unique to APT41. Uh, the particular variant um, of this malware um, that, that was used in this attack, um, as well as the loaders that uh, started up, um, which are named Stealth Vector and Stealth Mutant, uh, were all actually covered by both uh, Trend Micro and uh, ESET last year. And both reached the conclusion that the tool sets, as well as the underlying activity, um, could be traced back to APT41. Now, in our case, it wasn't only the mere presence of the implant um, that kind of suggested uh, that APT41 was involved, but it was actually the fact that um, the scramble cross implant uh, that we found reached out to uh, command and control infrastructure that was shared with Moonbounce. So if you recall, I described that Moonbounce eventually sets up uh, the stage for uh, the execution of a malicious uh, user mode component uh, that reaches out to a server in order to fetch subsequent payload. Uh, 
So as it turns out, uh, some of these Scramble Cross command and control servers shared uh, the very same domain uh, with Moonbounce's uh, server, which is uh, this uh, glbaitech.com uh, that you can see on the screen. Uh, not only that, but all the domains, um, both the one corresponding to Moonbounce and those that reached out uh, reached out to by Scramble Cross resolved uh, to the same IPs in different points uh, in time. So um, in addition, uh, we could also observe that uh, quite a few of the servers on those uh, IPs responded with a unique certificate that was only used uh, by infrastructure leveraged uh, by APT41. In fact, uh, some of these servers uh, that uh, use that certificate were, sp were specified in a security uh, bulletin um, that was issued by the FBI in 2020 that uh, outlines some, outlined some of the indicators that um, could be identified with the activity of APT41. Other than APT41, though, it appears that uh, there was presence of um, several other implants on the same network uh, that could also be uh, affiliated to uh, Chinese-speaking uh, threat actors. Um, most notably, uh, we found a backdoor named Microsyn, uh, which is known to be used by uh, a threat group named SLM, uh, or Six Little Monkeys, um, um, that um, Actually, if we look more carefully at the timestamps of deployment for uh, both Microsyn and Scramble Cross, uh, which we um, already established as very likely connected to Moonbounce, uh, it appears as though um, both pieces of malware were actually used or deployed in tandem. And this could allude to the fact that Microsyn was in fact um, a tool that uh, was used as part of the very same uh, operation in which um, Moonbounce was uh, leveraged. And actually, it could also suggest that uh, um, APT41 and the SLM threat group um, may share some resources, uh, be it um, shared uh, tool sets uh, or actual developers that um, could be um, coordinated by uh, those uh, two groups. Um, apart from that, uh, we could also take note of uh, the compilation timestamps on some of the images uh, in those uh, attacks. And, and if we try to understand what those mean, uh, then first, if we look uh, at when the infected uh, Dixie dispatcher uh, was compiled, uh, we see that it happened back in 2014. And that actually seems to correspond to the date in which the particular firmware version was uh, released by the vendor. Uh, in contrast to that, uh, the P images that uh, correspond to the driver and user mode malware stager of Moonbounce uh, seem to have been compiled in proximity to one another uh, during the end of 2018. Now, what could that mean? So for one, if we are to believe those timestamps, time then, um, well, obviously you can understand that those could be fake, but uh, if we are to assume that they are correct, uh, then we can assess that Moonbounce uh, was actually compiled apart from the original firmware. And that's actually a pretty plausible assumption. In fact, uh, the idea that the attackers had to access the specific uh, core, uh, the specific Dixie dispatcher image, uh, parse it, and then uh, introduce uh, those subtle changes that um, I described earlier, suggests that the attackers had um, an likely ongoing access to the infected machine. Um, now, considering the timeline uh, and other backdoors found in the same network, uh, we can assess that actually those other backdoors that we found could have facilitated, uh, facilitated a remote uh, and longstanding access to uh, the machine in question, which would finally allow the deployment of Moonbounce. Um, apart from that, um, considering the 2018 timestamp, um, we are kind of faced with an important question. Um, if we are to believe uh, this um, um, compilation timestamp, uh, and we know by fact that the UFI firmware infection actually happened uh, during uh, mid-2020, um, we found it in 2021, but the infection itself um, 
occurred sometime uh, mid 2020, um, then we are faced with the question uh, of whether moon bounce um, could have been circulating somewhere between 2018 and 2020 in other places in the wild uh, before we found it. And that actually is a question that remains to be uh, answered. So now that we know how moon bounce works uh, and we have a general concept of who deployed it, it's worth trying to think how we can better protect uh, against uh, it or similar attacks uh, that target UEFI firmware. And here, as much as I would like to devise a single solution, I think that uh, the best approach is actually considering a set of hybrid methods to mitigate such an attack. And the first one is being um, a very simple proactive measure uh, of updating uh, the UEFI firmware with uh, vendor authenticated images uh, casually. Of course, uh, this could prove to be insufficient as uh, some firmware images uh, are not well protected. Um, and this is why it's actually advisable to use uh, additional protection layers. Um, two notable examples for that uh, would be uh, technologies like uh, the Intel uh, BootGuard and Trusted Trust Platform Modules, or TPM. Uh, in the case of TPM, um, which, uh, as some of you may know, is uh, sort of a designated crypto uh, processor uh, on, on the machine, um, this is a feature, actually, that is ought to be enabled uh, by default in Windows 11. Um, so if you're not using Windows 11 and you do have uh, the support for TPM, um, I do uh, suggest um, verifying that it is turned on because uh, that would be um, a useful measure against such attacks. Um, unfortunately, though, not all machines support um, BootGuard or uh, TPMs. And there are still uh, a lot of legacy UEFI firmware uh, circulating in the wild. And for this reason, it's also beneficial, uh, beneficial to consider um, an additional security solution that uh, can scan UEFI firmware um, and uh, notify the user um, if there is some anomaly found within it. Um, except this will only be efficient as long as the um, network or organization that uh, deploys such a solution um, has actual uh, people that are trained um, to identify such alerts and act upon them. So in that sense, it is also important um, in light of uh, attacks like uh, moon bounce to train uh, the blue teamers or um, analysts that deal um, with threats in the organization in the organization to be aware of alerts that concern um, firmware compromise. So, on this note, um, I'd like to address um, maybe on a more uh, general um, uh, term, the problem of UFI firmware attacks, um, which um, um, is the fact that albeit uh, the defense mechanisms that I just mentioned, a lot of UFI firmware is still vulnerable and uh, quite exposed um, to abuse by uh, threat actors. Uh, on top of that, um, the security industry as a whole, um, it seems, still lacks uh, visibility uh, into this type of threats, um, which um, were actually publicly tackled in the past few years, but they are certainly not a new threat. We have all seen um, the UFI uh, bootkit that um, was in use by um, a hacking team uh, back uh, in 2015 and 16. Um, and we can estimate that the threat of uh, UEFI firmware compromises um, probably exists uh, for um, a little less than a decade. Um, so by no means the fact that moon bounce and similar threats were discovered right now um, means that uh, this threat is new. Uh, or that this threat is, um, is about to go away. So um, we should realize that such threats are actually here to stay with us. And that's why it's important, uh, at least in my opinion, uh, that security vendors um, uh, will share or give more attention um, to, the to, to such threats and will share the information that uh, concerns them, um, as we did in this case, 
um, because that uh, is what will essentially be able to educate and alarm uh, blue teamers uh, and defenders um, as to how uh, such threats behave uh, and how to address them uh, in order to um, employ better mitigations. So with that, um, I think our time is up. And I'd like to thank you for your time and attention. Um, if you have any questions at this point, I'd be more than happy to take those. And thank you. Thank you, Mark, for the presentation. Uh, I think we actually have two questions already in the chat box. Is it all right if I ask them, uh, read them out sure. loud? OK. Yeah. Um, does it have hooks, tools to threaten Linux OS? Sorry, could you, could you repeat that question one more time? Yuri is asking, does it have hooks, tools to threaten Linux OS? I'm um, not sure what the, this let, let me open the chat and, and see it, but uh, if I understand the question correctly, uh, the, uh, the question is whether that uh, particular threat is also applicable on the Linux operating system. Is that, is that the question? Well, I believe so. If if it is, then uh, actually no. Uh, Moonbounce in particular is um, designated for uh, the Windows kernel. There are a lot of assumptions uh, throughout its execution um, that kind of um, as, assume that the um, loaded operating system is actually Windows, and um, it will not work uh, on Linux. Um, that said, though, um, we cannot exclude that there, there is a variant that would essentially target Linux, um, but um, it, it's not the variant that we discuss or that we found. Thank you. Another question is, uh, do you think Measured Boot will be able to catch such attacks? Well, uh, I think uh, yes. Uh, well, Measured Boot will certainly uh, be able to notify uh, of an anomaly uh, in terms of modifications that happened in the firmware image. Um, however, it's up to uh, the people who, uh, who read the logs uh, and kind of uh, interpret what happened during boot time to be able to understand that uh, there was um, a compromise going on and that uh, this compromise has to be mitigated. So yeah, by, by all means, measured boot uh, will be at least if effective in the sense that it will indicate that there is a compromise. Thank you, Mark. Um, we actually have a few more questions. Um, you've mentioned TPM as a countermeasure. Will it raise the bar significantly in your opinion? Um, well, for this threat, yes. Um, because right now, um, the situation is that um, this particular threat and actually other ones, uh, Mosaic Regressor that we uncovered uh, back in 2020, um, and also uh, Logix, they all kind of relied on the fact that um, the underlying firmware did not have proper uh, protections against uh, writing. And uh, considering that, um, all of those, uh, this kind of um, change, um, in the firmware and and to to kind of uh, raise um, a red flag in case of that that um, that the signature of the firmware doesn't check out. Um, having said that, um, there could be other measures to 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 bypass TPM, uh, which we'll not go into in, in this talk. So I wouldn't say that TPM is a bulletproof solution. It's it's. It's not, um, you know, unfortunately, we cannot say that anything uh, in our uh, world or in the domain of security is a bulletproof solution. However, at least for the attacks that we have seen so far for the three public known cases that uh, we know um, that um, uh, employ um, compromise of uh, UFI firmware, um, in those cases, TPM would have definitely raised the bar, yes. All right. Um, how do you avoid a scan from being fooled by the implant as it can potentially mani manipulate any tool running in user kernel mode, running from a separate physical host? 
sorry i i uh i i didn't follow the question uh, uh, no problem i will repeat it how do you avoid a scan from being fooled by the implant as it can potentially manipulate any tool running in user or kernel mode running from a separate physical host um well um for one we have um already discussed well there was this question raised about measured boot uh, so re measured boot has its own uh, mechanisms i'm not an expert in tpm but but i do know that measured boot has its own mechanism of um sending uh, encrypted logs um to to possibly an external server uh, where uh, it could be, uh, let's say, compromising the UEFI firmware does not mean that uh, compromise happened uh, to the TPM. Uh, in fact, I, I don't believe it's, it's that simple to do. So um, in that case, in the case of TPM, the logs of measured boot can still be um, um, used to, to alert the user of a possible compromise. Uh, as far as um, um, having a UFI firmware implant, uh, fooling a, a kernel mode uh, solution, um, like a driver uh, or anything actually that happens uh, after the boot, well, I definitely agree that there's a pro problem here uh, because if you cannot trust your UFI firmware, then, well, you cannot trust everything that is loaded afterwards, uh, which is exactly why I think that uh, there should be usage of um, additional uh, components that, um, that, that kind of allow um, um, verifying um, what goes on in the UFI firmware itself and that are external to the UEFI firmware and not being uh, loaded by it. Um, that, that's, that's as best as I, I, I would, I would you know, tackle this situation. All right. Um, how do you verify if your machine is affected? Manish is asking this question. Um, well, in the case of Moonbounce, uh, well, it's hard to you know hard to answer this question generally. Uh, obviously, you cannot always know that your machine is infected. Um, however, for Moonbounce, um, because um, it 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 had some anomalous behavior um, happening um, even after um, the execution of the UFI firmware implant, for example, uh, the injection of um, uh, of payload from uh, the kernel mode driver uh, to user mode process, um, and then having that um, injected code reaching out to a server. Um, this is a behavior that is being caught or that was caught uh, in our case by our product, and, and I assume will be caught by a lot of security products. So um, in any case that um, you may encounter um, an infection, and you know, a, a simple measure as um, let's say um, formatting your hard drive and reinstalling the operating system doesn't seem to remove the threat. So the threat keeps coming back. Um, then you have you know good a good reason to 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 speculate whether you might have some more lower level uh, infection of course that won't be the first thing that i would uh, consider but it will definitely be one of the things that um at least nowadays uh should be uh thought of as um uh, as a marker uh that a um kind of low level bootkit um firmware compromise um could have happened Thank you, Mark. We have one last question from Danny. Um, how do you think the main vector of infection was? Well, um, as I mentioned, um, we assess that the infection um, has taken place um, remotely and um, it, it was done um, through, well, I cannot say exactly what, what was the utility that was used to override the firmware, but I can definitely attest to the fact that uh, the underlying um, firmware itself did not have any proper uh, protection mechanisms. 
and against writing. Uh, for this reason, um, it, it is not that much of a problem or was not that much of a problem to override the firmware um, um, that, that, that resided on that particular machine. So, so having said that, um, well, considering this, I mean, it, it, it is plausible to assume that um, the override happened through a uh, software, not, not through uh, access to the hardware itself. Um, and uh, the other thing is that, um, well, now the question is asked whether that uh, override happened locally. So somebody uh, approached the computer and, you know, um, leveraged uh, is local access to override the firmware or uh, has it been done um, remotely? And we think it was done remotely because um, the, the uh, particular changes that um, were taken in that particular firmware, so uh, those uh, subtle hooks that were installed um, in the original uh, core uh, Dixie or Dixie dispatcher image, um, those required um, the attackers to have some kind of long uh, standing access to that particular machine. They would have uh, had to um, uh, read that image, um, introduce some changes to it, and then override it. And, and um, that is assessed to, to have been done um, along uh, across uh, some uh, period of time, across um, you know, an extended period of time. And um, given the fact that we have seen other um, uh, backdoors in that network um, for, for a quite long time span, um, we can assess that some of these backdoors were used to facilitate this uh, long-term uh, access that would eventually allow the attackers to uh, prepare uh, the tempered firmware image and have it uh, overwritten um, in the targeted machine. Thank you, Mark, for answering all these questions. Um, I think that we can conclude the webinar now. Thank you very much once again, Mark, for your presentation. And thanks for everyone who attended today's session.